name is Kurt Borger. I am the library director here at the Riverview Public Library. Today we have longtime, 40 plus year resident of Riverview right. and former city council member, Jack Hesterson. And he is going to talk about some of his experiences, not only in the service, but some of the things that he saw uh, as a child during World War II. So first, I'd like to ask you a few questions sure. just to get to know you there, Jack. Uh, where and when were you born? I was born uh, September 30th, 1932. What were your parents' occupations? My father uh, worked for a company called National Gas Company, and his job took us to uh, several cities. Uh, his job was to go into a city, set up the infrastructure, so they can lay gas lines to all the homes because some of the homes that uh, he, they had to do had little or no heat at all. And that was his job. We, uh, we were in Atlanta for a while. From Atlanta we went to Macon, Georgia. Then from Georgia we uh, went to Jacksonville, Florida, the city. And after he, while we were there, he and my mother decided that they wanted to, just on a Sunday, drive out to the beach, and that was called Jacksonville Beach. And they liked it so much that they decided to, that was where they wanted to stay. And it just so happens that in that city, like so many small towns, during the 40s, the homes were strictly summer homes and they had little or no heat at all. So he was busy setting up the infrastructure to lay gas lines so that those homes would have gas. I went through school there and... Is that where you graduated from high school? Yes, I graduated from a high school called Duncan U. Fletcher. In what year? Uh, 1952. And uh, I was just a, a typical B plus student. I took uh, a lot of science and math classes because I knew I wanted to go maybe not into the science, but I knew I wanted to go to college and I had to have had the typical classes to get into college. So uh, that got me in and like I say, told you, I was t studying broadcast journalism. At what college? The University of Florida in Gainesville. How, how long were you studying broadcast journalism? For, I was there two years. Because you entered the Navy, uh, well you entered the reserves. I was in the Naval Reserves. Reserve in 1952. 1952. Gainesville was not my first choice of college. What was your first choice of college? Auburn. In Alabama. In Alabama. But... Uh, Why was Auburn your, your first choice? Well, I had heard that they had a pretty good radio program uh, there. And that's, that's what I wanted. I... Uh, the reason I didn't go to Auburn is even though I was accepted there, was the fact that uh, they didn't have a naval armory. They did not have a reserve unit in Birmingham. And I did not have a car at that time. And I would have had to have driven quite some distance in Alabama to go to where they had a reserve unit. So when I, when I knew that Gainesville had a unit, that's where I decided to plant my roots, so to speak. Let's get back to your family. Okay. You said you, they eventually settled in Jacksonville Beach. Correct. And your dad worked in uh, basically not city management, but implementing, you know, heating right. and, mm -hmm. and systems, that kind of thing. Uh, what did your mother do? Well, she was a homemaker for a while, and then she got a job in the post office. 
uh, which he worked until she retired. And uh, how many siblings did you have? Well, just me. I oh, was just only, you, child. only child. Now, when you enlisted in the U.S. Naval Reserves, what were your parents' reactions? Did they did they say anything? No, my. My father was always one. I think my father had a lot of influence on me because uh, even when I was growing up, I, uh, I had to take jobs that he said gave me character. And uh, I might uh, not have liked the type of work I was doing, but uh, at that time it paid well and that's what I wanted. What kind of jobs were those? Well. I worked as a uh, welder's helper in the shipyard, and uh, you can, I guess you could say I detested that job with a passion, but uh, I stuck it out because, as I told you, it paid good, and at that time, I was looking to help myself to, through college, through, you know, to get money to pay for books and, and supplies. So uh, I stayed with that job until I went to college. What I should have asked you before is why did you enlist in the, in, the Navy, oh. in the Naval Reserves to begin with? Well, I went on cruises. I just wanted to go on a cruise. <laughs> oh, it, it, it was simple as that? Well, th it was that simple that I joined the Reserve. Understood. But uh, in the Reserve, I was uh, studying to be a radio operator on board the ship. And uh, that's what I did when I went on these cruises. I actually uh, worked as a regular naval person while on these shoot, these cruises. Cruises would go to some places in the Mediterranean. They went to the uh, Korea, Caribbean area. And, uh, but mostly the one that I enjoyed was the one that went to uh, the Mediterranean. That was, that was, and even that that was, was only like a three-way cruise. What kind of ships were these? Were they destroyers? Well, kind of uh, destroyer on the one that went in the Caribbean, the one that uh, went to the Mediterranean was what they call the track transport we had, uh, a full complement of Marines on board, and uh, it was our duty to take them to an island, and they would practice landing on the island. They, there were like 1,150 Marines on board this, this one ship, so they, it was quite crowded. So they, these were training ships for air. Right, it was a training landings. ship, right. What was Typically, how long? You said the one, the one cruise lasted three weeks. Three Typically, weeks. how long did these last? Well, a long cruise would be a month, and uh, you know, I got I got paid regular, regular uh, naval pay during that time, but uh, my uh, my thoughts still were in broadcast journalism. And so, when the cruise ends, I went back to college. Well, they, you, I took well, a break. You, oh, you took a break. Like, these cruises were always in summer. Oh, I see where it says, you're in the like, Naval Reserves. Right. You're in the Naval Reserves, and then they assign you a ship. You, you go on the cruise forever, however long. Then you come back, and then you go back to school. Right. Do I understand you correctly? That's correct. What was out of the places you did? You even have time to visit any of these places? When no, you, when not you went really. Uh, I went. Uh, we one of the cruises went to Bermuda, and that was pretty nice because uh, having been from Florida, I was used to sand that was white. In Bermuda, it's pink. It's the color of coral was a, a very interesting island to visit. 
your duties on these cruises, you said radio operator, correct? Radio, radio operator. Uh, tell, us, tell us a little bit about, the, about that. Too. Well, the radio operation at that time consisted mostly of, uh, of it was voice, but it's also something called CW, that's Morris code. And most of the messages were sent uh, because they were encrypted messages were done in code. And then we would take the encrypted message and put it in language that uh, the people would understand, you know, the commanding officers. Did you enjoy your time on the, on the ship? When we went on a cruise, there was always somebody that I knew from college on the cruise also. And he was probably on there the same way I was because one of the reasons why a lot of people, myself included, uh, joined the reserve was that during that time, there was a heavy draft going because they were in the midst of the Korean War. And this gave you uh, a deferment. You got a deferment both as a student and for being in reserve. So you go back to college? Yes. How long, how long did you stay back in college? And this uh, was, again, this was the University of Florida. Right. Uh, I stayed there almost a year and my unit got activated. Well, I was supposed to fly out of Grozeal. And this was on the, uh, would have been on what's called a familiarization flight. We were gonna fly to Miami. And from Miami uh, to another island. And when they, everybody boarded the airplane, the, uh, the CO came on board and said the flight had been canceled because of a hurricane down in Florida. And so we would not be going down there. That night, I happened to meet my wife. This is my wife, Georgina, whose name, we call her Georgie for short. She's the one I was lucky enough to meet <laughs> at that lucky. dance <laughs> at NAS Rose Hill. Yes, he was lucky. So then, Planes canceled. Plane canceled. Planes canceled. I met this, met this young girl. Where? Pardon? Where? Tell us oh, about the okay. circumstances. Okay, it was at the uh, NCO office uh, uh, rec room uh, in the basement. Uh, they had a band, you know, it's like a, just a, a club. And she and some other girls came over that night, and I walked across this the door, the store, and I asked her to dance, and then from the rest is history after that. What well, bunch of us girls would go on Saturday night, and we'd all go together, and we'd go to the dance, and we would pick up these sailors. Oh, and that, that was here at the right, that was the Naval 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 Station. You were supposed to fly to Miami, but right. it got canceled because of the hurricane in Miami. Because now tell us how you got from Florida or wherever you were stationed to Grozeal. From Florida, I went to Charleston, South Carolina. Had a duty station there. From Charleston, I went to Norfolk, Virginia. And from North Virginia, I went to Great Lakes Naval Training Center, and from there, that's where I was going to get the billet on the Rhine River Patrol, but instead they sent me to Grozeal, an island in the river. <laughs> Just in the Detroit River, not the Rhine River. Right. <laughs> What were your duties at the Grozeal Naval Air Station? Uh, ground Electronics Group. We took care of uh, all the electronics and uh, 
all the vehicles such as the uh, crash unit, the, uh, the hospital had an ambulance, we took care of that. We took care of all the electronics in the control tower. And uh, there was another group that took care of electronics in the airplanes. They were called air electronics. And uh, I spent my time there until I got discharged. You were discharged in 1956. Yeah. What did you do after you were discharged? Okay, first job I had, I worked for uh, Spear Iran Electronics. And they had, uh, my duties there was, I was assigned to General Motors building. They had a huge computer complex there. And uh, I took care of uh, all the machines. And uh, I was scheduled to go to an advanced school on computers, but uh, I uh, went to work for Burroughs Corporation. Why? Because Burroughs paid more money than what I was making at Sperry Rand. Then that's when I, uh, when I went to Burroughs, that's when I entered the Detroit Engineering School. And I was going to school full time at night, working during the day and going at night. And from there, I got the job at Martin Marietta in Orlando, Florida. I was down there three years and uh, worked at the Cape and uh, was, uh, was in charge of a group. Well, when I went to the Cape, was uh, assistant launch control director and that job, if you've ever seen on television and heard there's always a person in the background said, the missile is 135 nautical miles down here, that's the assistant launch control director that you're hearing. So that was you? It was me. And when you say the Cape, just so anybody Cape watching, Bar Cape Canaveral, right? Cape, right. And how long were you there? Uh, three years. And then what did you do? Came back to Michigan. Then I got a job at uh, Ford Motor Company. I worked in scientific research. I worked in product development. Well, anyway, I worked there almost 31 years till I retired. What year did you retire? Uh, January 1, 97. And what have you been doing since you've retired? I choose just to uh, stay at home. Let's go back. You were telling me that you had some interesting experiences oh, during okay. World War II. Uh, you, how old were you? Um, well, I was like 11 years old when all this that happened. There was a there was a lot of development being done because at this time. Second World War was starting. See, this was 1942. In 1942, the government had great interest in Florida because of its, its closeness to, to the ocean and it, the shape of its land. In fact, cities were literally, this is a figure of speech, literally being built overnight, cities were, to accommodate the service personnel who would bring their families with them to serve in the Army of the Navy. In Jacksonville, there was a huge Naval Air Station built. And at the beach, there was a seaport built at a city little town called Mayport. And there was so much development being made that uh, it, was, it was almost like traffic was gridlocked. And like what I was telling you, it's far different today, you know. Today it's all high rises, all mega highways. And 
everybody was adjusting to one another, really. Uh, on April the 11th, 1942, the reason I know the exact date is because this is ever forever stuck in my mind. We had gone to the show. The local theater on Tuesday used to show double features. We watched the show and were coming out. And as we came out of the theater, this terrific explosion, the whole heavens just opened up orange wide. And we found out that a oil tanker was coming up the coast, was torpedoed. The submarine torpedoed the tanker on the starboard side, which is the right side of the ship. And we went down to the beach because it was only like walking down a block. And when we got down there, there were hundreds of people. In, and we could actually see, we knew that the submarine was on the other side of the ship because if the ship is traveling from south to north, the right side has to be. Well, he tackled, he torpedoed him, and you could actually see the shells bouncing off the surface of the, this tanker. And then we were about to witness something, although at that time we really didn't realize it. The captain of this U-boat he maneuvered the sub around this oil tanker so that he was broadside, if you can imagine this, to the beach. In other words, he had placed the submarine in harm's way. And they were shelling the uh, tanker at that time. And then we could see because the submarine was fully silhouetted now. We could see the the crew from the sub boat on the deck and the and the, uh, the deck gun firing at the oil tanker. It had a second explosion, and these people that worked on that tanker are now jumping into the water, and the water at this time with the second explosion, even the surface of the water was on fire. We later found out, this is, would take a couple of years to find this out. We found out that so many ships, American ships, were being torpedoed on the East Coast that the President of the United States, who at that time was Roosevelt, it put an embargo on all news. So the next morning, in the paper, there was nothing about suffering. I mean, servicing and sinking an oil tanker. Well, that was because there was an embargo on all the news. And after the, it took three days for the tanker to sink. And in the meantime, it's on fire all the time. But life at the at Jacksonville Beach was never the same after this ship got torpedoed. Were there any were there any survivors from the tanker? Well, uh, there were, to my knowledge, there were. There were, okay. But uh, there were a number of things that just drastically changed overnight. Number one. You couldn't walk on the beach in the evening. That was completely out. And not to you want to, because with all this oil that was on the water, when, the, when it would wash in the shore on the beach, it just, you'd be walking in oil. So there, even if you wanted to walk on the beach, you couldn't. So another thing was that, uh, Everybody had to live with the ration book. 
and gas progression and all the cars had to have a cover put over their headlights and they had a small slit in there and this is so that no light at all would reflect back in, out into the ocean because they, years later people found out that the reason that ship got sunk was that there was a big party going on one of the piers and the lights reflected out in the water and the ship just showed up like it silhouetted the ship. Silhouetted. And so it was just easy pickings for that German captain to uh, find the right place to put his torpedo. Uh, the thing is that we, like everyone else, had to live differently. Uh, the, the, the ration and also uh, there was one of the things that I never got used to was my mother, you couldn't buy butter at all. She'd buy this margarine and mix it with this yellow food dye and as far as I learned, it never tasted like butter, it never tasted like anything. <laughs> but somehow all of us accepted this way of life and it became just our way of life to live with for the rest of the war for the rest of the war and we no sooner got used to all the ships out there and they used to just drop depth charges they would crack the windows in your house they would, the dishes would fall out and fall on the floor and break from the vibration, you know, and it really must have been a nightmare to those mariners and the subs to have to live through because uh, those ships might be out where they wouldn't be visible from the shore, but you could feel a concussion from that depth charge. And then June 17th, of 1942, we didn't realize it, but two submarines, the U-202 and U-584, were headed to the United States. There were eight saboteurs in two groups, four each. The first submarine, U-202, put their uh, four off at Long Island. And four days later, they put four off where? Not at Jacksonville Beach, but Ponte Vedra. And which, Ponte, is, which is how far from Jacksonville Beach? Okay, it, Ponte Vedra is about three, four miles south yeah. of Jacksonville Beach. So, in essence, it's the same area. And it left the saboteurs off there. And the group in New York, two of the saboteurs panicked. And when they were getting ashore, a member of the Coast Guard, but the Coast Guard's duty was to patrol the beaches around cities. And we had the same Coast Guard type of uh, group at our beach and anything that washed up in the water after the ship got torpedoed was the property of the government. I don't care what it was. And if they saw you taking something out of the water, they could if they wanted to arrest you, but they never had to because the group in New York, two of them, one's name was John Dosh, and the other was Ernest Berger. They panicked, and they went to the FBI office in New York City and told them that they had landed on Long Island. 
And the FBI already knew that somebody had landed there because the Coast Guard reported it because they had seen him. And they knew when the group at Punta Vedra landed, the FBI was there. They weren't there waiting for him, but they knew they were going to, to do it. And these two groups of four, four people each, they had certain duties. The group that landed in Florida, their job was the bomber plan in if landing. That's where they were supposed to destroy airplanes and destroy the factory if they could. To this day, I've always felt that uh, where, the, where are these Germans, let me back up and say, where these four saboteurs landed in Florida, they landed at a spot that in the 30s, two German brothers came to Florida. They built this home in the most godforsaken place that you could find had caught fire and burned to the ground and only the foundation was left. And anyone who had lived at the beach <coughs> knew about this house, these Germans, but they never associated it with saboteurs. I always felt because these saboteurs, they had all their uh, things that they were going to do to blow up factories, railroads, and things like that. They buried it at that exact same location that those German brothers had in an area where the undergrowth would have covered a complete house. And to this day, I've always felt that there had to have been somebody local there with some kind of device to signal that submarine because it would have been impossible because well, there was no GPS available during those times. It would have been impossible for a, a, a sub to have pinpoint that exact location to dump all their explosives. And I've always had, there's three theories I've always had. Number one, conspiracy, maybe, proof, none, Subject for a new book, definitely. <laughs> you know that in the war there was always lots of stories of legends. And some of the legends were true because later on in the war when they started really destroying some of these submarines who had free will during the 41 and 42, they could just run up and down the East Coast at will, they would disembark from a sub in a rubber boat or somehow, they would go in town and they would buy groceries from the store, carry it back to the sub. And the reason they know it was stored because it ran when they, later on in the 50s when people would die on these subs, they would find like bread wrappers that had local bakeries on it. So there was lots of uh, legends and uh, there was a, a bar at the, at the beach that legend has that Germans used to come up and drink beer. But you know, very few legends have ever been proven. Refuse substantiated. Right. Well, it sounds like you had uh, some very interesting stories from that time, and, and you were young. And well, that, that's true. I was young, and when I, uh, when I went to the university, I had a professor in creative writing. I would tell him about these, just like I'm talking to you, I'd tell him about some of these things. And he always wanted me to research and write a book 
on these supposedly legends that I had that, you know, that there had, and I still to this day figured, always felt that there had to have been somebody that was local because several local people were arrested for being sympathizers. Now, whether or not, you know, it was one of them, there's no proof to prove that they were. But if you were to go there today and see that, you'd see that the undergrowth is just tremendous. And you, even if there was a house there, you wouldn't be able to see it. Right. Well, those are, those are some interesting stories. And, and uh, I was thinking that you, being in Florida and seeing that, you had a very unique experience that most Americans who stayed stateside did not did not see. Well, I, I can relate one experience I had. The night that the ship got torpedoed, we went down to the beach, like I told you, and there were people there, but the group that we were in, it was deathly quiet. The only thing you can hear, I mean, because everybody was, a, they were afraid at that instant, you know, they didn't know if the Germans were going to come up from that sub and, and come to the beach. All you could hear, and this really impressed me, where the grown men and women were crying. You know, and there were other groups where you could see people praying. So it, it really affected not only me, but everyone else that happened to witness it. Well, like I, like I said, it was certainly something unique that you had witnessed. When now it's okay, here you have that part of history that you were witness to. Now, let's talk about a little bit about local history that you were a part of. Uh, you were city councilman here uh, from what years, Mr. Kesterson? Uh, let's see, 1978 until I think I got defeated in. 82 or 83, uh, the dates, uh, I don't remember now, but uh, I enjoyed being on the council. Uh, I enjoyed working with uh, the fellow people that were on the council. Who was the mayor at that time? Uh, Rodago. And uh, I had we each had little, our own little projects that we were, we'd get together at the end of an election and we'd say, okay, uh, Bob, what would you like? I and mean, Jim, what would you like? And mine was, happened to be the landfill at that time. And uh, it, uh, it, it, it was in operation at the time, full operation. and. One of the things we were looking at, we wanted to get a resource recovery site for the uh, landfill, which they could, you know, take things like tires, and you can uh, strip the rubber from the tire and reuse it. Obviously, not reuse it. Right. How I, do you think? What What do you see as the biggest change that Riverview has gone through between when you moved here or your city council years and now? Okay, I, I think what I see is a cohesiveness between the city and the school. And I think that's good. You know, that uh, the city, city has things that the, the school can use and the school has things the city can use. And to be able to use those in conjunction with one another, I think is a, is a big factor. It's beneficial. I think uh, that's a good question. 
I, I, well, for somebody who's lived here for a, a long time, I, I think it's it's uh, an important question to see, you know, what do you see as the largest difference in the community, you know, within those. Well, I think uh, one of the big things years. that's happened is the repaving of Fort Street. That that has really opened up the city quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I I think that. The city moved west a little ways, and that, that's opened up new homes, and uh, that's good. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, we, we, the wife and I live in the westernly most portion of the city, mm -hmm. and still be in the city now. Right. Let's talk about your family. Some you said you met your your wife in the Navy. I, do you have any children? Okay, we have two children, uh, both grown. Mm -hmm. do, son, they live, do they live in the area? Uh, they both live in Wyandotte. Son Jeffrey, uh, he lives in Wyandotte, uh, and the daughter Dawn, she lives in Wyandotte, and my granddaughter, who's recently got married, she lives in Wyandotte. So. They like wine dogs. <laughs> I see. Well, and at least everybody's local. Right. So everybody's local. And the last question I'd like to ask you, Jack, is how do you think the service impacted your life? And if there's one thing you could tell people who are watching this interview, how did, you, how did it impact your life and, and how it important was it and what did you learn from your military experience? Okay, what did I learn from the military? Number one, I quickly learned to accept orders without question. Number one. Number two, I learned to, to stick with the job no matter how bad it may be when you have people are relying on you that uh, sometimes you just have to do it. I know there are a lot of people now that are doing work that they really don't like. They'd like to be doing something else. But uh, that's one of the big things I learned from the service was to do something, do it as good as you can to the best of your ability and uh, accept those orders. All right, Mr. Kesterson, we are finished. And I would, is there anything else you would like to say? No. I, I don't have any further questions. I you. think this is great that uh, you're giving me the opportunity. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. To the pleasure is that anybody who is, it is the communities, actually. And we'd like to thank you very much for coming in your service to the country. And I hope that uh, somebody or anybody that is interested in that, there are two books available, many books available. One that I've read is called the Drum Operation Drumbeat by... We have that here at the library, I guess. Right, mm -hmm. which is available in your local library. Exactly. And there's another one called Torpedo Alley, which describes how the German U-boats had complete control of the Atlantic Ocean in the early stages of the Second World War. Uh, I think my wife and I are both vicious readers, and uh, I try to read like a novel a week now. Oh, that's good. <clears throat> the spies, it, their whole story is quite unique, and it's unique in the fact that they were able to pull it off without being caught right away, and, and the terrific failure because they never got to do anything. Uh, You'll see some pictures that I have from, uh, I, I got from the FBI site. Uh, 
six of them were electrocuted yeah. because it was a, a military tribunal and two of them were sent to prison. The two that panicked, and if it hadn't been for them, they would never have known that the spies were in, in Florida. And just that uh, it was a terrific story that could have been, you know, but wasn't. Your mother's <clears throat> friend that talked to the spy. He came oh, yeah, well, I, uh, we got that. I'll go ahead and tell it. Okay. When I was in the midst of thinking I was going to write a book on it. Right. Okay. I, when the saboteurs landed in Florida, they landed in this isolated place that nobody knew that they were there. And they wanted to catch a bus to Jacksonville. They walked a short distance north to Ponte Vedra. And they went in this so-called general store, combination store, post office, and you name it, and it mm -hmm. was there. They asked the lady there when the bus would be. She told them, well, the bus doesn't come here, you've got to go to Jacksonville Beach. And they did, and their, their route to Jacksonville took them directly in front of our house. Oh. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Well, again, Mr. Kesterson, thank you very much thank for you. coming in. And thank you, those were very interesting stories. Yeah, she's my chauffeur now. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Such is life. Exactly.